should stop fucking around. I'm John Cronshaw, and I'm joined again by another guest. Today we have got RJ Barker. He's the author of the Wounded Kingdom fantasy series, and I wanted to talk to him about violence and fight scenes because his book, Age of Assassins, I think deals with that really well. Hello, John. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I love doing stuff like this, and I'll endeavour to make sense and not get too, too sidetracked, which I, I do <laughs> a lot. What I wanted to bring you on the show for was you've got a character called Girton, who is a assassin. But the way you wrote about the violence and about the killing and about, you know, actually inflicting damage on people and fights, it was done in such a different way. And I've read before, I really wanted to kind of pick your brains on this. Because what I hate, and I think this is a problem a lot of authors have when doing fight scenes, it's like he pummeled in with his left hand and then his right, he struck his left cheek. And it's like, it's too mechanical. I'm terrified of violence. I've been in violent situations. Mostly my way of dealing with violence is to hide. I'm very good at it. <laughs> and I'm really wary about making it seem cool. Uh, and there, there isn't an element to, of, of sort of excitement and coolness in, in what they do, I think. But but also, there's a price to pay for it. You don't just walk away from it. And one of the things with setting up the character of Girton was that from the first book, I have the feeling that if he had a choice, this this wouldn't be his life. It's not particularly what he wants. Um, he's forced into it and he's very good at it, but he, he doesn't actually enjoy it. He's not a, a murderous person as a as a hobby that's not what he'd, he's like he's all, yes that's up for it he'd rather avoid it and then when it came to the actual way the fight scenes work that i fenced uh, and and i love fencing unfortunately my, my health means i can't can't do it that much but fencing's like chess it, it's like chess but it's very quick and i wanted to get some sort of sense that when you're fencing you somebody comes at you and you're thinking how do i counter this and you know the names of the move and how it's meant to work, and that's what you try and do. But it's like that. That's what I was trying to capture with it. And the idea that actually it's very choreographed, um, and all martial arts are, are, are very choreographed. They're, there's a set of moves, and I wanted them, him to have these set of moves because I didn't want him to be superhuman. I wanted him to be very well trained. Uh, and that's kind of what I bring to the, the fight scenes, is you have this kind of balletic vision in the first book because it's all nearly all one-on-one -on -one. and also I, it, it sounds silly but because I, I was ill for a long time and a lot of that time was spent being in agony which is just no fun but I learned about pain management techniques and a lot of the stuff he does to sort of center himself and, and bring him into a calm place where he can go in and let his training take over it is pain management techniques like breathing and, and just sort of finding a relaxed place and that, that's kind of how I set up the fight scenes, that to some degree he's not particularly thinking. Does that make sense when he, when he goes yeah. through them? That it's all very instinctual. And, and then afterwards you kind of have this sort of rush of the world coming back in and thinking, thinking oh, oh my God, I nearly died. That, that was terrifying. Yeah. And that's called the setup for the first book. There was a scene that really struck me where you've got Gert and he's a lot older, he's almost out of practice, and then he gets kind of accosted in these woods. And it's just like the m most brutal kind of horrific experience for him being in this violence. It is very much that he, he's rusty. He's not been, he's, he's, he's being a teenager, really. He's, he's spent sort of five years going, I'm not going to be an assassin because, because no one tells me what to do. And then he's come back and, and found that what he is is needed to help people he really cares about. Uh, and that fight scene is, it, it's really unpleasant uh, and it, it's kind of rolling around in the mud, just trying to survive. There's nothing glamorous about it. And I think, I think that's an important thing to get across about violence. It's not glamorous. It's awful. It, it's not not something you want to be involved with. Always run away is my advice, which he never takes. But <laughs> In terms of like the writing then, I mean, you, you mentioned this thing about the fencing and, you know, kind of having that link. I mean, you name the sequences. You have like, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's like, you know, it's the first sequence or third sequence and it's this. And then you, you almost have a description of what the move set is while it's happening. On a boring technical level, it's a way of controlling the way the reader sort of sees it. Um, and I want it to be quite filmic. So you kind of get this. You, he tells you what he's going to do, and then he, you sort of see the effect of it. He says that this is the first move of the, the shepherd's crook. They're not called that. I've just made it up off the <laughs> – <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm doing that in a second. Um, and 
And then he goes into it and he describes what he does and the effect it has on the other people. And it, it's partly that and partly, um, about altered states. I kind of, I very much want you to have this feeling that when he moves into fighting, he kind of just gives himself up to it and his training's taking over. He's not actually consciously doing it. it it's kind of a, he's moving through this set of, of, things and his subconscious is doing it and then you get um in the second book there's a cavalry charge which is one of the reasons i wanted to write the whole trilogy where they they're, they ride around on these big antlered horse cat things and he's involved in this cavalry charge but he's not trained for that he's not ready for it and it's completely different it is just panic all the way through he's no idea what's going on because that that's the difference when when he's in that situation that he's trained for and that's what he is he's very good out of it he's kind of Oh, oh, oh my God, this is actually terrifying. The moves. This is a good writing lesson. I wrote the first book, um, and I wrote it in six weeks because I was kind of a bit manic about it. I had this idea and I thought, I could write that, and I did. And I didn't take any notes whatsoever. And then it sold, which was a bit of a surprise. And I had to write another one. And I came and I started and I thought, oh, I invented all these moves with names. I should probably have made a note of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I had to go back and, and, and write them all down. So I had it all right. And that is a really good lesson. If you do something in a book and you're going to have to write more and it's got definite sort of things, just note it down. It'll you, save you yeah, so much yeah. frustration later on. World building Bible as you go. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> when you're a writer, you're basically told to be very specific with your wording. And I think that can actually be a detriment with fighting scenes because I think it could take away from the flow and you know as you say it's re- like they're, they're meant to be really quick and really brutal it's almost like you've got to give the readers the opportunity to fill in the blanks I mean any, anyone that, that's done or if you've just watched fencing or, or anything like that violence is quick it, it is really quick and if you read about historical sword fights there were these ones that went on for ages but they're, they're very very rare like the, the sword fight in the Princess Bride is um, between the Dread Pirate Roberts and, and um, Inigo Montoya is fantastic, but very rare stuff like that happened. It, it literally, you, you'd have seconds and somebody's dead because that, that's how it's, it works. Uh, without armor, our armor sort of changes everything. But um, I kind of like like the idea of I'm trying more to focus on how he's feeling during it rather than what's actually happening. And, and you don't really get much detail and nearly all his strokes are killing strokes i think when when you sort of read them because he's, he's often against more than one person so he's just like you're dead you're dead you're dead you're dead in the first book the way it's done it is you you see him in action early on and he's kind of in a a way to say he is extremely good at that he's about to go into this fight and his master says oh do it unarmed just to show how cool he is that he can do that and to show that he's also, he's learning. So she's asking him to do it as a learning task. So he takes these two warriors down without much trouble, unarmed. And then later on, there are other fight scenes, but by the time you get to the climactic fight scenes, um, everything's kicking off and he has to sort of fight his way out of a place to get to another place. But that that's tiring. And by the time he's sort of getting to the end of the book, he, he's wounded and he's tired and, and he's not, you can't be a, a, an amazing warrior 24 seven. And that, that kind of interested me in the first book that you kind of get by the time he's coming up for what should be the big climactic battle with the people he's been set up with earlier on in the book. He's knackered uh, and people he probably could be around a field all day uh, are easily outmatching him and he's really struggling. Um, uh, and I like that. My first trilogy that I wrote was a, a post-apocalyptic trilogy, and I wanted it. So my main character in a post-apocalyptic trilogy never killed anyone. It's almost like you, <laughs> you kind of have That's to. That's really hard. Yeah, yeah. And I've got in the third <laughs> book where there's a scene where he does actually pull the trigger for his gun fucks up, and it's like he then has the rest of the book of, of like just having this heaviness and the burden and kind of going through the rest of this book almost trying to cope with the yeah, fact I wanted to do it. that he was a killer but he's, I wanted you know, to do it yeah yeah and, and that was really hard yeah. for the character and what I like is especially with your book is that they're not just random fight scenes that don't link to anything it's like 
okay, there's an emotional reason for this, there's a character reason for this, mm. a plot reason for this. It's like they're all in service of something else in the story, which is, I think, where a lot of new authors get lost, unfortunately. It's taken me 16 years of, of never selling anything. I think I, I, I made $5 in that 16 years from writing. Um, to sort of get to a place where I can just sit and write a book. And I do it that way because it, it works for me. Um, and other people need to plan and, and do stuff like that. But there are thoughts going on in your head and, and the thought that's there. And I think it should be there for every writer is, is this telling the story? Is this telling us something about him? Like that, that scene that I said earlier on where his master says, right, do it without your blades and fight these two men. That, sort of shows you a couple of things. The way that it's written shows you that he's quite cocky, um, which he's going to get taken down a peg or two later on. The fact that he can do it shows you that he's incredibly skilled because you don't know these things at this point. It's the first fight sequence in the book. Uh, and the fact that she is saying, do this in your blades means that he'll do what she says. And it shows you that he's still learning, even though he's really good. So that there's all those three things. And then in the second book, there's a huge set piece battle right in the middle. I start in my head with a few things that I want to do. And it was one of the things that I wanted to do. And there's a siege in a village. And as well as the whole battle that's, that's going on, there's a metaphorical moment with, within that siege where he, he's, something happens to him. He's forced to make a decision about... I'm trying to do it without spoilers, people. All right, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I know what you're getting at. Yeah, this is um, a bit where he's yeah. got to reveal, there are weapon, reveal yeah. something about him <laughs> that is important to the plot. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah there's, there's that. There's, 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 there's a thing that's important to plot. And also there, there's a thing with with weapons that goes on where, where he's he changes weapons that, <laughs> that is also quite important. That kind of when I, when I imagine them as a trilogy, that I always wanted that to be in the centre of the book. I think it's probably the best fight scene I've written so far, that whole sort of chaotic siege. But it it doesn't exist to be a cool fight scene. It exists to put Gurton into a position where he has to make a decision on why something has to happen that that is very important to the plot and how he's seen later on in the book. So it, it's always there's always that thing going on. So I, I want to do this. A, because it's, it's fun to write, and, and B, what, what is it going to say, and how is it going to be useful later on? And that decision yeah. does have like a massive cost for the rest of the story for in terms of his personal relationships and things like that. So Everything he does is in some ways always coming back to haunt him. He's kind of... He, he, I feel quite sorry for him. He has a terrible time. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you wouldn't want to be him. But, um, but yeah, I mean, every decision all, all the way through the book. But it was... I was quite lucky because I, I wrote them so quickly. By the time I was editing the first book, I'd written most of the second one and I had a clear idea of the sort of, I do kind of two things. There's a, there's a meta story going on through, that sounds so posh, meta stuff. Like I know what I'm talking about. It's not. I've just, I, just, I just heard somebody say it and it sounds really good. There's a, a story going on through all three books, which is the story of him and his master and his best friend's, uh, and I always knew where that was going and how it would end and um, what was coming. And the other person who I'm not going to talk about, well, I can talk about a bit, but I'm not going to give much away. So by the time I was writing book, editing book one, I was making sure I was putting in things that in book one that resonate in book three. Uh, so that, that was quite sort of useful and, and, if I'd written them more slowly, I don't think I'd have had that opportunity. There, there's stuff in book one, which if you, once you read book three, if you read book one again, you'll just go, oh, my God. Oh, I see what you did there, which, which I quite like doing stuff like that. OK, I'm going to have to do that then. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, you can, you can definitely say that, you know, the, the three threads and the links and everything. Yeah. The other thing that I was going to say was that um, although I knew that I had that big that big idea going on. When I sat when I sit down to write each book, when I sat down to write book three, I literally had no idea what the story was. I knew they were going to go to Doc, which is the capital, and I knew that was involved, and that was it. Uh, and it, it, it was quite frightening. So it like <laughs> I think I had three months to write it, and I was like, ah, oh, this is okay. But but I just wrote it. That's what I do. I start sitting just write stuff. And there's a there's a plot point 
regarding CDOC and something inside it that I just wrote as a throwaway sentence uh, as they're approaching it. Uh, and it was completely unexpected because I, I like stuff like that. And then I sat there looking at that sentence because by the about 10,000 words in, starting to get a vague idea of what I wanted to do. Uh, and I wrote that sentence and it just wrecked everything. <laughs> and I just thought, that, what, why, why would that even happen? There's no, there's no reason for that. That's a terrible, terrible idea. But I'm going to do it. Uh, and uh, that was <laughs> That tends to be how I do things. I just uh, yeah. I'm interested then in your writing process because I mean the thing with Russ on this show, you, you know, I'm helping him through his first book, his first novella, and he's had so many full starts and got X amount of words in and all this, and he's now finished the first draft of his first novella. And part of this was because we went through things like outlining and looking at plot structures and things like that. And like I've tried, I mean, you know, they call it pantsing down a way you just sit down and write. And I've tried that <laughs> several times and failed like that. Just, I don't know how that works with people. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, the stuff I'm working on at the minute, I'm doing a 21, 22 novella series. And it's like, I feel like I'm pantsing it, even though I've got the plot points for the ending of each of these books like everything else in the middle is kind of up for grabs. But when you say you sit down to write, I mean, how long have you been kind of thinking about it? Have you got scenes in your head? Is it like, right, I know where this is going? Or is it just like, right, I'm going to start writing and whatever happens, happens? I would never, ever say that my way is the way to do it to anybody. Uh, it's the way I do it. And one thing I've learned through life is that I, I am... An individual person. I think eccentric is the polite way of, of, of referring to, to me. Um, I think, I think Assassin, anyone who sits I, I, down for several months to write one story, you know, I think we're all yeah. we're all in that. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's not it's not right. It's slightly obsessive. Um, I just it's weird that you said about writing. You've, you've written your trilogy with somebody who doesn't kill anybody. I just written. I wrote a pacifist space opera with them. Um, huge amount of violence in it which you wouldn't expect but um the main character in it was a pacifist and he he never killed anybody or or raised his fist in anger and i love it and, and it went to um publishers and uh, there were a few publishers that really liked it but it didn't sell in the end um i will come back to it though because i, I dearly love it uh, and then when you have a book on on submission for for me i can't do anything else i'm stuck I kind of puts me into like this limbo place where I kind of should I write more of that or should I do something different or what should I do and I just can't. And it's really weird. It's like being stuck in the fog. Um, and then when it came back and they said, no, my agent at the time was absolutely gutted. And I was just like, no, that's okay. I can, I can write again now. And I'd spoken with an editor, an editor called Matilda Imler, who was a head of Zeus at the time. But she's not anymore. And we had a really long conversation about Agatha Christie. Um, and that had sparked something in my head because I'd started writing something else on the advice of some editors who said, you might be really good at writing this thing. And then Age of Assassins kind of landed in my head, more or less fully formed. The first thing that came was the idea of the tired lands. And I thought that that's evocative. And then I thought, but, but I'm, I'm going to write science fiction. I'm, I'm not a fantasy writer. <laughs> and then the, there's a proper Agatha Christie style denouement in, um, Age of Assassins, and that appeared in my head, but without any reasons as to why these people had done these things. It just appeared in my head. Uh, and I thought, like, oh, oh, I really want to write that. And then kind of the rest of it just sort of filtered in. Uh, and it was like being hit with a brick. I had the whole book in my head, so I sat and I wrote it. I actually, for that one, did do kind of sketchy outline because I had certain points in it, like... um the fight in in the woods that Gurn has in that book and the idea of him being stripped of of all his martial skills he's he goes undercover and he's he's pretending to be someone who isn't martially skilled for people who haven't read it why why haven't you read it what is wrong with you um but he goes undercover he's not allowed to be a warrior which which is good because it strips everything that he considers to be him from him and he has to sort of find out who he is again i knew that idea um i knew there was a fight in the woods i knew the anymore and I knew how magic worked and it became sort of linking those up and, and I knew the um the character of Queen Adran because I'd been writing a historical script about Margaret of Anjou who was a, a fascinating and wonderful character and, and I based Queen Adran on her 
and and I also knew that it, it was about Merrilla and Gurton and this mother and child relationship and, and you have that there's this very healthy all those healthy for people that murder people for a living um and then you have Queen Adra and her son Ador who, who are like a really dark mirror of Gurton and Merrilla there, there's this a biological mother and son but it's awful and wrong and not how you should be a parent and and my son was four four at the time i wrote it so parenting was was big in in my mind and how to be good at that so so that one then the second one i knew about the fight scene in the middle because i wanted this center point to the entire trilogy i had this kind of weird idea that the books are a set of scales age of assassins and king of assassins are, are written the same way they're both set in a castle they both have flashbacks to tell the stories of a character and then Blood of Assassins is written in a slightly different way. It's all very open and, and you don't have the flashbacks. You have these kind of things that some people really don't like, but I love them. They kind of, they don't really make any sense. They're, they're to do with, I wanted to write things that were just a bit disquieting rather than things that particularly told you anything. And some people have gone, these don't make any sense. And I'm just sat there happily going, no, they don't. They're wonderful. Isn't that lovely? But um, you don't have to like them. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, so I had less of an idea with Blood of Assassins and then King of Assassins I literally had no idea what I was writing when I sat down I sat down I wrote it all but um, my subconscious I, I'm, I often find that I'll be writing things and I'll get to a place and what I do is if I get to a place and I think oh um, there really needs to be a talking cat at this point but I've not written a talking cat in I'll just carry on writing from there as if there is a talking cat and put a note on it and think I'll fix that because this is the thing, the point I was getting to. It can take me a long time, but I'm there now. Um, I think it's really important when you write a first draft to give yourself permission to be terrible, which is what I always do. I always presume my first draft is going to be terrible. I don't question that. I don't correct anything. It's mostly read. I, um, I write words backwards and stuff like that for whatever reason is going on in my head. And I correct nothing and I go through it yeah. and I write it all. We call this the shitty first draft. This is really important. It's yeah. like you've got to get through it yeah. and just keep pushing and keep on that kind of that zone of just the creative zone, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. In terms of like your editing then, I mean, how, how long does it take you to fix all the kind of, you know, you're coming up with something as you're going along and then obviously you've got to kind of foreshadow it or, you know, not make it seem like a deus ex machina or whatever. So like, you know, are you kind of doing more work? after you've written the first draft than you would say if you'd outlined or, um, you know, plotted the story in a different way. <laughs> this is the bit that um, annoys other other writers. Um, hello, Anna Stevens, author of God Blind, who always tells me this when we do paddles together. Um, I tend to find that my rubbishy first draft is reasonably close to what it's going to be in the end. So far, touch wood. And my subconscious is working away because, you know, I mentioned the talking cat that I need to be there and I've just presumed it is. So I'm going to write as if it is from there. I'll often find when I'm going back that actually there is a talking cat and my mind <laughs> set, set this stuff up <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, well, that's that's fortuitous. And, and I'm also I I like puzzles and I can't keep much in my head. I, I'm. I'm often confused. I get lost a lot, um, but I can keep an entire novel in my head. So I think when I'm writing, my, my mind is sort of working away and making things work in a very subconscious and unhelpful to write in podcasts um, <laughs> manner. Um, but I don't tend to do much, many changes. With Age of Assassins, we put in a subplot with my editor. There's um. There's Prince Ador, who's like the, the, the top unpleasant boy, and he has two sort of unpleasant lieutenants. And they kind of circle round in the book to come back as, as Girton's sort of nemesis, nemesis, nemesi, whatever, um, at the end of the book. And that wasn't there originally, because um, my agent said, you, he said, you've made a mistake here. The reader will want some form of bad person getting their comeuppance. And I was like, oh, all right, yes. And then there was um, a scene that my editor wanted to put in. There's a scene where you see Merrilla face off against another assassin. Uh, and my editor said, we need that in because we, we never see her actually fighting. We need to know how good she is, which which I'd, I'd missed completely and, and she was right. 
Um, so they were the only real changes we made to Age of Assassins. Then Blood of Assassins, it had a prologue on it that when I send it to, because my editor gets quite a, a reasonably early draft because my deadlines were so short for these books. Um, I think I had about seven, seven, six months for each book. And there was a prologue on um, a <laughs> My, ed- my editor said, you've made a mistake with this prologue. And I loved this prologue. I'd set something up in it, and I, I kind of echoed this this moment throughout the book. And it was really poetic, and I really loved it. And she said, no, you're wrong. This prologue just it, it, it makes me uncomfortable. And I don't think the readers will see the girl you've set up in that prologue. And, and I wrote Jenny um, a five-page email explaining all the reasons why she was wrong. Um, and I got to the end of it and thought, oh, no, you're right. Damn it. Hard getting real yeah. criticism, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 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 So we, we took the prologue off, but the actual plot of the rest of the book didn't really change that much. Everything was there in that one. And then King of Assassins, we barely touched at all, really, in as much as I, I kind of, I kind of got Jenny's edits back and, and I was thought, have you just given up on me? <laughs> is, is it that, that bad we can't? There's too much work to be done, so we just thought, right, we'll, we'll gloss it over and do a little bit and see, and just put it out there, and then we can be done with it. Um, but and I, and I talked to her because she's brilliant. It's my editor, Jenny. I, I love her. Uh, but, and I was going, you've not done very much. And she went, I don't need to. It, it's cool. Just and I was going, no, no, we we need to do more editing. I'm sure. And she was, no, no, trust me. It, it's it's there. It's good. I'm a very bad role model, I think, because I'm just lucky. You know, my mind happens to work in a way that lets me do that. I'm not entirely sure what I will do one day when my editor turns around to me and says, all right, this portion doesn't work because what we really need to do is um, refocus this character in X way so that this happens and gives me lots of technical details because I will just go, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> I'm, I'm lost. Ed, my agent, once sent me a thing and said, oh, you need to take out more adjectives from this story. And I was like, oh, God, I have to Google adjectives now. I don't know what they are. (laughs) 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 Don't don't quit school because you're going to be a rock star at 14 is a good bit of advice that I should have taken from my dad. And I was never a rock star. But, um, yeah, I'm deficient in the technical aspects. (laughs) I wouldn't worry about it. You know, it's it's the difference between uh, naming parts and knowing how to use something, isn't it? So, whatever. I'm a great believer that if you read a lot, you, you know how to write a book. Yeah. Uh, and that's the essence of it. And everything else is finding ways to unlock that knowledge and make you confident enough to go with it. Uh, whether, and if that involves you planning, because I know that, um, Ed McDonald, who wrote Blackwing, he writes his first draft the same way I do. He just sits and writes a book and he doesn't do any planning. But then he takes it apart afterwards completely. He kind of destroys it and rebuilds it um and then anna stevens who i mentioned she massively plans everything she does uh, and we all sort of get to the same point and i've got kind of a reputation as a quick writer that's because i, I don't redraft an awful lot not because i write x amount of words a day in terms of your writing then you mean do you have like a, a writing habit or you know do you have a, a routine that you stick by or is it a piecemeal approach. I'm lucky enough to have been really ill, so I didn't have to have a proper job because I was too I'm too ill to have a proper job. Um, which it doesn't sound like it should be lucky, but I think it is because that allowed me to sit and write. Um, and what I try to do is during the week I try and sit down and write 2,000 words a day. That's always my target to do that day. I don't put any pressure on myself to do it, and if I don't do it, then I don't do it. And, and some days I will play PlayStation all day and not do any writing because my mind isn't in that place. <laughs> but not very often. But that is my target each day, 2,000 words, because that means I have 10,000 words by the end of the week. And then I can do a 150,000-word book in, in theory, 15 weeks, which is quite good for me. It doesn't work that way. But that's what I do. But I think the important part of it is not the how many words I do per day it's the not putting any pressure on myself to do it because that's that's where you start having problems because you, you start oh god i, I don't i only did 1500 words yesterday so i need to do 2500 today and and maybe that that's that's not what the bit you're writing needs maybe the bit you're writing actually needs 700 words and that's a really good place to finish so so do your 700 words and, and stop or maybe it needs 100 words some people like only do 
100 words a day or 200 words a day and that's that's how they work one of the things that can send you a bit loopy as a writer is self-expectation where i expect nothing of me i'm always quite surprised that i do anything so i i every day is a win for me i mean it didn't feel like a win when i, when I was doubled up in agony but but it, it's it was an investment <laughs> yeah yeah um, and you've got a lot so, of pain to draw on and all that stuff so <laughs> yeah yeah. I'd, I'd rather not be chronically ill, but I, I can't do anything about it. So you may as well make the best of it that you can. And I think the other thing is that that I love to write. I, I, re- I can't believe I wake up when when I first got a publishing deal. A lot of people sort of said, "You, but in a year you're kind of you've got used to it, and you'll have seen all the bad things of the industry and and how how it's difficult to be an author." And, and that is just not my mindset at all every day i wake up and think i can't believe i'm actually doing the thing that i love most and getting paid for it that's mental uh, and it's just joy every day is just like i'll get to do this thing that i love even when it's hard and, and things like copy edits come in which are essentially quite boring it's still words you know i love words and i think not putting any pressure on yourself and finding that love in, in what you do and just enjoying it are, are tremendous for getting on with stuff it makes it really easy you're just like oh i think yeah it's like we, we're getting paid to plop stuff out of our imagination it's like <laughs> what, yeah. what it's, yeah. Well, yeah, and it's the nearest to actual magic you can ever do that you sit up and you invent invent things and then other people actually read them that that's that's mad somebody in in america now is is reading a story that i wrote and, and it, it just fills me with amazement every time i think something like that Yes, yeah. it's just I just imagine what twenty year old me would have thought if I'd gone back and told him that. Just be like, no, no way, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen because I am going to be a star of metal, and I would have had to go say, sorry, but you're you're just not very good. <laughs> and I'd have been, <laughs> I wouldn't have believed me. I'd have been, no, shut up, granddad. I mean, with the, with the disability stuff, I mean, your your protagonist has a club foot. He he has a you know a disability that affects him, and it seems that that also affects some of the other characters in the story. And again, that's something that I think when I started reading the book, you know, I read the club foot thing. Oh, oh no. You know, like the, the dread of the, I don't know. There the seems to be like, Oh, he's, he's disabled, but he's, he's magical because of it. And it's like, it wasn't that at all. I was really glad. Yeah. <laughs> Someone pulled me up on something and it was, it, I, they said, don't answer your critics. And I generally don't, but sometimes I think people say things and you can, and I'm not the sort of person that gets angry, so I, I'm not worried about offending people. But they they said that they were disappointed in the book because they wanted to see how Gerton got around things despite his disability and how, how that forced him to act in different ways. Uh, and, and I kind of stepped in and said, because what they were saying is absolutely fair and right. Um, and it was something I gave a lot of thought to when I wrote the book, I'm, am I going to do this? But I also had a, Another point that I wanted to make, which was that being disabled in some way is is not everything you are uh, and it becomes your normal and you just get on, just get on and you do stuff. And that was the I didn't want to muddy it. I wanted to be that the fact of him that, yeah, he has. To be fair, what wouldn't be counted as a disability in medieval times? Byron swam the Hellespont with the club foot. So it's not a, a hugely disabling disability, but. I, I wanted that because I wanted him to be able to do things and I wanted the one of the messages of the book to be saying being disabled does not make you unable. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And that, that's the thing with him. As the books go on, his disability is mentioned less because it, it it becomes more and more your normal. You don't you don't think about it. It just becomes the way your life is. You you become used to like you hear people say, Oh, you're you're so brave to be going through this thing and that I always Think, no, there's, there's, it's not bravery when you don't have a choice. It, it's just the way things are, and you you kind of you you want to carry on, and that's what I wanted to do with him. He's he's carrying on. He's not letting it stop him. And if anything, it's an advantage to him because people constantly underestimate him, and he uses that. And also, yes, it is a bit cheaty and lazy of me to choose something that lets him kind of cop out of some like. He, he never gets up and thinks, I just can't do it today. I, I'm too tired and ill. Because uh, um, it's an adventure book, and yet you have to make some sacrifices. But I, I have had people disabled come up to me and, and say, that's the character I've wanted to read. 
for a long time. That's what I've wanted to see is somebody who isn't bitter or, or held back by it, who is going, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's annoying, but I'm going to get on. And that means a tremendous amount to me because it, it's from my experience of, of barely being able to walk some days is where he comes. That was serious for me. You know, I'm coming up from my own visual impairment and it's just like, it just makes me cringe when I see, like, you know, the, the blind seer, the blind wise man, you know, all those kind of tropes that are just everywhere. And it's like, uh, <laughs> it's like, okay, get some, get some. Do something. Yeah, even stuff like, to some degree, Daredevil, I'm never quite sure how I feel about Daredevil because it's kind of Daredevil is, he is blind, but also he's magically not. Yeah. And I, I always, <laughs> and I was like, uh. I really enjoy it with that little thing. He's like, oh, he's not really blind, is he? It's kind of, it doesn't affect him that much. So, so yeah, but I'm, I am equally guilty of that. So, but yeah, and, and also, I also think that I'm, the other thing that I should have said it is it's important to show people because the, the more you, you, you normalize something, um, the more people accept it. So I think it's important that you have disabled characters in books and you have characters from different backgrounds and different places in books that people can see, not only because for the people who, who are that and see themselves and think, oh, God, that, that, that's me, um, but for people who, who aren't that or maybe live in a place where they never meet anyone who's a bit different so they can come across people and think, oh, well, there's people in this book and, and they're not what I'm used to, but they, they do seem perfectly human. How amazing. Um, and, and I'm very very into that i think we need to show everybody i think it's important and, and it, it's fantasy so there's nothing holding you back there's nothing stopping you putting everybody in it and just going look at all these amazing wonderful people with all these differences and they're all getting on and doing a thing and that is fantastic as long as you're not sort of doing it for like token value or collecting points to sort of tick your little boxes yeah, yeah there has to be reasons if you get the chance and the books sound interesting to you and, and you you enjoy them let me know i don't think people ever realize uh, not just me actually any author that was a bit selfish of me i don't think people real and you'll know this john um i don't think people realize how people have to say that writing's um a lonely thing and i don't think it is because actually we, we have like people we have editors and, and i have a, a publicist who, who's constantly making making my life hell she's she's a terror you'll have seen her on twitter being mean to me um uh, and my wife and my family around me but the actual Knowing what your book is doing when it gets out there, you can see like sales figures and stuff if you want to. I don't personally look because it, I think it would just be something for me to be anxious about. Um, but but um, there's moments when somebody comes back to you and says, I read your book, I really liked it. Just that, it's just stunning. I, I can't imagine that ever getting old for any author. So if you, yeah. if you go out and you enjoy a book, tell them. When someone likes it because of why you wrote it if that makes sense like mm. I, wrote, I wrote a book yeah. that was called blind gambit which you know it's one of the it's, it's basically a bit of a ready player one type of thing where it's set in a virtual world my my main character yeah. is blind in the real world can see in the virtual world but half of the book was set in the real world and was basically about this teenager coming to terms with going blind and you know mm. when someone has actually come up to me and said that story is what i needed to hear it's like i don't care about the other reviews or whatever this is you know this is why i wrote it mm. it was almost to talk to this one person if that makes sense so, yeah. yeah and it, and it is it is a message to think that it's it, even if it's just somebody saying i really enjoyed it it's just just an amazing book that's much when somebody says yeah that that's what i've been waiting for i, I, I just astounding Tell us if you if you, if you didn't tell the authors if you like stuff, it makes them so happy, mm-hmm. and then they will write more, and it's all good. And Amazon reviews, sadly, yeah. I feel like such a corporate shelf saying that, <laughs> but um, our publishers love to see Amazon reviews; it makes them very happy. And we we have very fragile egos, so you know anything like that. We do, we do, yeah, yeah. Five <laughs> feed star, us. feed us, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where's the best place then to find your books? I mean, where should a reader start if they wanted to get into your work? You can get hold of the Assassin books on um, any good bookshop will have them. If you're Northern-based Waterstones and Leeds, I believe, have some signed copies, as does Waterstones Norwich. And 
So any Waterstones, any good bookshop, some bad bookshops, I imagine have them, but is there such a thing as a bad bookshop? You can go to the Amazon, or, always. Um, also, if you go to my website, which is rjbarker.com, I think there's some short stories on there that are probably not representative of the books, but, but they're, they're quite, I like them. Um, and there's, there's short stories dotted around the internet and stuff, just all manner of places. Yeah. If if you ever want, I do, um, I'm having some book plates printed up. Some, I have some, but um, if you want a signed copy, I send them out for free because it's a nice thing that I can do for people. Um, yeah, just just find me. I'm about, I'm quite happy to talk most of the time, as as John has sadly found out. So <laughs> witter on. <laughs> And um, wish your friend huge good luck and just let him know it, it's not the doing of it, it's the not giving up. You know, that's the truth of it. Thank you very much for listening and thanks to RJ Barker for coming on the show. Remember, you can check out the Stop Booking Around book. It's on Amazon, Kindle, paperback, Audible, all that good stuff. And you can follow me on the Twitter at JL Cronshaw. Hopefully I'll have Russ back in a couple of weeks to talk about his second draft. So until next time, cheerio.